camera's on. Hello, and welcome to the MIT SDM Systems Thinking webinar series. My name is Naomi Gutierrez, Communications Administrator for SDM, and I am today's host. Today's speaker is Atanu Mukherjee, President of the engineering consulting firm MN Doster & Company Limited. He advises the energy, materials, and commodity industries in strategy, technology, operations, and finance. He also serves as visiting faculty at the Indian Institute of Management and has previously held leadership positions at Microsoft and Digital Equipment Corporation. Atanu is an alumnus of the System Design and Management Program and also holds a graduate degree from the National Institute of Industrial Engineering, Bombay. His talk today is titled, Enabling a Gasification-Based Sustainable Industrial Economy for India. If you have questions for the presenter, please enter them into the chat window at the side of the video. They will be addressed during the Q&A portion of this session. The recording of this presentation will be available online after today's session, and a link will be sent to all registrants. And with that, thank you, Atanu. Thank you, Naomi, for that introduction. Um, I think uh, you know what I'm going to talk about today is, um, is something very exciting, uh, I believe. And this has got to do with uh, energy and energy systems and how some of the developing countries uh, can adopt energy systems using traditional fossil fuel energy at the same time making sure that uh, you know, you're carbon compliant and uh, sustainable production is achieved from the different industrial systems that are designed. So the topic of my discussion is enabling a clean coal based energy and industrial ecosystem in India uh, through gasification and carbon capture. So the two key elements of, uh, of, of this uh, system has got to do with gasification, which is essentially uh, turning uh, coal into gas and using that gas for industrial purposes. And also in the process, uh, making sure that you capture the carbon and uh, use that carbon either for industrial purposes like, uh, like manufacture uh, of products and or uh, you know, taking out oil or uh, in, the, in the worst case, uh, putting it underground in terms of storage. Right? Uh, before I start, I'll just do a quick, quick introduction of M and Dastur. We are, we are a pretty old company, about uh, 60 plus years old, uh, founded by an MIT alum in 1948. We focus on energy infrastructure, metals and mining, and essentially in the area of business technology, engineering and operations. Uh, so let's look at a couple of things that, um, that I want to talk about. right? And uh, one of the things that we need to understand from an economy-wide perspective is what are the goals that you need to really address, right? And so uh, the first order of our business is to figure out what the goals are in terms of a clean coal-based gasification system uh, along with carbon capture, right? 
And we've got to think this in the context of the overall economy uh, because what you're talking about is a design of a system which affects uh, the macroeconomy, which affects the industrial ecosystem, which affects uh, the sustainability, and obviously uh, it affects uh, the socioeconomics of the country, right? Uh, so the, the purview is very broad, and the goals need to be framed accordingly, and the system design has got to be done with those goals in mind while taking into account the different interfaces and the different uh, complexities that arise uh, while addressing such goals. So if you look at some of the things that we want to do, uh, one is that, especially in the context of some of the developing countries, and in this context, in the context of India, is to really look at exploiting uh, the large endowments of uh, what we call as low-rank Indian coals. Uh, and uh, we say lower rank because uh, these coals are, 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 are not exactly pure. They've got very high ash content and very high impurities. And so they're not exactly high in energy content. Uh, so the idea is to convert these lower rank Indian coals with the right gasification technologies to be able to enable, to, to enable a clean coal-based economy so as to produce uh, a couple of things, right? Uh, uh, in terms of chemical systems like uh, methanol, like chemicals, like steel and power, which are uh, the lifeblood of any developing ecosystem. Uh, in the process, obviously, to increase the GDP. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, by deploying uh, clean coal-based systems, we are able to enhance energy security. Uh, at the same time, reduce the crude dependence and reduce emissions uh, across the entire value chain. So, uh, so the idea essentially is to use the, the, the impure coal systems, or the impure or the high ash coal, to drive uh, directly the increase in GDP and the industrial ecosystem. Uh, in the process, specifically, uh, we want to develop a viable carbon capture, use and storage infrastructure, which can store, which can capture and store up to or above 75 million tons per annum of carbon dioxide, right? Which is, which is fairly significant, right? In the context of a developing country like India. And uh, in building such a system, or in building such uh, an ecosystem, uh, we find that, uh, that we might have to uh, have about 60 plus billion dollars of investments uh, that need to happen uh, through international investments or national investments uh, over a 15 year cycle. And finally, I think, uh, what we want to really make sure, right, uh, is not to reinvent the wheel. A lot of these things in gasification space and carbon capture space has been happening over the past many, many years, probably decades, right? And uh, specifically, if you look at uh, the programs of DOE uh, and the programs of ARPA-E, uh, you'll see a lot of these technologies that have developed over the past 50 years, 60 years. And the idea is to adapt uh, and evolve these, uh, these technologies, right, and the related subsystems to be able to really uh, accelerate the process of design and development, right, of such an ecosystem, right? So essentially a policy-driven collaboration and investments in technology transfer uh, and also enabling imports uh, is essential, right, to really create commercial scale operations. And like I said, we're not talking about a pilot, we're talking about commercial scale operations uh, across a large uh, set of industries uh, across an entire economy. Uh, if you look at uh, the, some of the drivers, right, and, and again, this is just a top-down approach to figuring out how we get to some of the decisions that we make in terms of how we go about uh, developing such an ecosystem, right? And one is, of course, energy. And if you look at the energy, one way to look at it is is to look at the total uh, energy matrix of India, right? And so I got a couple of figures out here, uh, it's a little number heavy, but, but just kind of like gives you the picture. Uh, on, the, on the left you got, uh, you know, the oil consumption of India in terms of imports and, and, and uh, national production. So you got the reserves out there at six billion. And this is a comp you got, uh, you know, US for example has got about, you know, 40 billion barrels, right? Saudi Arabia at the top has got about 270 billion barrels. That's a lot. On the other hand, this country like India has got 6 billion barrels, which is really, really low, right? In the process, what happens is that the consumption uh, is largely satisfied by uh, imports, right? So 1.7 billion barrels per year of imports in terms of oil. 
only 0.3 billion barrels of domestic production, resulting in about 2 billion barrels of consumption, and about you know, $70 per, per barrel uh, in the long run. You're talking about $120 billion of imports, which is significant for a 2.5, 2.3, $3 trillion economy. Uh, on the gas side, again, not much of gas out here again. You know, only got 45 trillion cubic feet of gas reserves as of today. This may increase, but looks like unlikely based on the formations that we find in India. And so again, you got a lot of imports are happening out here, about a trillion cubic feet per year of imports, a trillion cubic feet uh, gotten from, um, uh, from the domestic uh, basins, uh, resulting in about two trillion cubic feet of total consumption. And so essentially what you're doing is you're importing a lot of LNG. And LNG, if you, if you look at LNG, uh, which is essentially liquefied gas shipped from the United States or Australia or, or, or Middle East, uh, it's, it's not exactly very, very cheap, it's expensive, right? Compared to, for example, $3 per MBTU of Henry Hub in the United States, you're talking about $10 per MBTU, right? Which is significantly high in terms of energy costs, right? So finally, it comes down to the point like coal. If you look at coal, you got about $86 billion of total uh, high ash, low quality coal, right? Uh, of the total $150 billion, of the, of, the, of the total, I'm sorry, $150 billion tons, and of which the Consumption is about 875 per year. Significant amount of it coming uh, in through uh, through the domestic production, but a lot also still imported, right? Resulting in about 25 billion dollars of imports, right? So, to basically, what it says is that you got about a 150 billion dollars of total imports of energy drivers or, or primary energy uh, commodities, uh, which is uh, fairly large. And if there's an opportunity to diversify this in a way which is uh, which makes the country secure and, and resilient to the volatilities of energy markets, I think that's very good for the country, right? So, so that's one of the considerations in terms of how to go about designing a gasification-based economy, right? Uh, and, and one of the things that we looked at while working with, um, you know, we work with the, with the Prime Minister's office and, and, the, and, the, and the Department of Energy and, and other folks in designing in trying to design the system for the past two years. Uh, and one of the things that we look at is uh, substitution. And what does it mean in terms of the economics of substitution, right? And does that, does that offer a compelling opportunity, right? And so if you look at these graphs, these numbers out here, uh, you know, you got a couple of what you call buckets. You got petrol, which is gasoline. You got diesel, you got LPG, which is uh, cooking gas uh, or propane and butane. You've got olefins, which is essentially plastics, right? You've got coking coal, which is used for manufacture of steel, and you've got urea, which is used for fertilizers, right? And so if you look at each of these buckets, uh, the red rectangles give you the opportunity for substitution, right? So you've got, you got the demand and you've got the substitution effect in terms of both volume and dollars. And so if you, if you look at it from $2 billion to $6 billion in diesel to $2 billion in LPG, going up right to about $5 billion for NAFSA. The NAFSA is again a crude derivative which is utilized for, utilized for manufacturing plastics, right? And if you add all these things up, right, uh, you'll see that if you can substitute these by some derivative chemicals, right, produced out of gasification of coal, the opportunity for substitution, material substitution, can be substantial, which is at about $20 billion, and that's just about direct substitution. So we think and we, f we find that by using methanol, right, as a fundamental chemical uh, base, base driver, uh, one should be able to substitute uh, gasoline, uh, diesel through DME, uh, LPG through DME, which is dimethyl ether, uh, olefins or plastic production through, uh, again, methanol uh, to olefin route, which we call as coal to olefins, uh, substitute coal uh, in steel production, coking coal in steel production, by utilizing uh, uh, gasification uh, as, a, as a substitute, and similarly utilizing syn syngas, as we call it, from the gasification for urea production instead of, instead of natural gas but reforming, right? So all that adds up to about $20 billion in a very compelling way. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's useful to look at, and it's important, I think not useful, important to look at uh, the emissions, right? The GHG emissions in India, right, which, which will rise. Uh, uh, it's just the nature of the economy. Much as, all, much as all of us would like to have emissions as contained as possible, uh, it's unlikely that emissions will be contained uh, unless we do something dramatic in the fossil fuel space in the developing nations, and especially so in India and China. So if you look at the emissions out here uh, in India, you've got about uh, 
Uh, it's modest by by absolute standards, right? At right now, 2.5 going to five uh, five gigatons. Uh, compared to U.S. or for that matter, China, right, which goes up to about 18, 18 gigatons. Uh, still, uh, and also on a per capita basis, it's modest, but still the trajectory of growth, right, if you look at it, it's, 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 it's pretty steep, which basically means that if I, if I continue this way, uh, the, the absolute amount of CO2 emissions from uh, all the industrial sectors is going to be significant because uh, there is no way that in the near future uh, you will have uh, contained use of fossil fuels or fossil fuel bases for either production of uh, manufacturing goods or for generation of power or energy. And so this will continue to increase. Uh, the question is how do we contain that and get it to a much flatter trajectory and perhaps get it down to a trajectory which is negative over time. And one way to do that is, or not one way, uh, the way I think to do that is to really look at how do I continue using the fossil fuels, but we are able to look at capturing the carbon dioxide and uh, either utilize it or store it for the purposes uh, you know, of uh, carbon storage and sequestration or manufacture of industrial goods. And so uh, one of the things that we looked at is, you know, uh, on, the, on the right hand side, on the lower, lower right hand side of the graph, is what is the sectoral co contribution uh, to CO2 emissions of these different uh, sectors, right? And so you get power, transport, industry, and other sectors. And if you look at uh, three major nations, right, like India, U.S., and China in terms of major economies, 27%, uh, right, of the total sectoral contribution uh, to CO2 emissions comes from the industry. And this is the blind spot, by the way, worldwide. You know, we talk about renewables, we talk about all these uh, exciting things, but uh, very few people have talked about and really, or people have really addressed the issue of industrial emissions, right? which is significant by itself around the world, right? And so what we think by engendering uh, an ecosystem of uh, based on gasification, we can really address that 27% right, of emissions, CO2 emissions uh, in the industry by uh, using gasification of coal to generate methanol as a base, base energy carrier to be able to create uh, different kinds of chemicals and thus reduce the emissions of CO2 uh, from across the different industrial sectors. And so I think that's the primary, uh, one of the primary drivers in terms of how we, or rather the primary strategies in terms of how we want to go about uh, engineering such a system, right, across the economy. Uh, so, so what does it mean in terms of, uh, of, uh, of the foundations of a clean coal-based economy, right? Uh, and so uh, if you look at it, I talked about it a little bit, and let's quickly go through this. We've got about uh, 150 billion tons of proven high ash, low rank coal resources in India, right? And the top, what you call a pie chart like circle, talks about the different qualities of coal. G1 to G3 is a quality of coal which is very high quality, having very high energy content, and G15 to G17 is really bad quality, right? And so, so if you look at it, right, uh, the dark blue uh, semicircle, uh, which is uh, you know G9 to G14, right, essentially is you know the the high ash, low quality coal which is lying around, right? And the question is, can we make use of that in a way which is very compelling for the entire economy, right? And, and the bottom, bottom uh, left uh, graph talks about, you know, the composition. Uh, the key point to note out here is, is the percentage of ash, which is like 34, 39, 31, 35 across different regions. And that, you know, tells you about the quality of the coal and hence the energy content, which is not exactly very exciting. So the idea is to kind of like use this uh, in an economic manner at the right cost structure to be able to drive the gasification process across different industry sectors and to drive the, the production of uh, chemicals and, and energy carrier like methanol to be able to drive the economy, industrial economy, right? And the, and the, and the, and the deposits in terms of these, these coals of the different types, the dark blue talks about this large deposits, right? 35 billion tons, 20 billion tons, 27 billion tons in the eastern part of India, right? This probably is pretty much the area where you would uh, establish a lot of these kind of uh, gasification ecosystems. Uh, and here's, uh, before we go out of, you guys might be thinking, what is this gasification thing? But this is essentially what you do is, is very simple, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, not, it's no rocket science out here. Uh, you got oxygen, you got water, uh, you got coal and biomass or pet coke, right? Which is fed into this, uh, into this gasifier, which is essentially a vessel where you partially combust uh, these, uh, these fuels. And uh, using oxygen or air, uh, in this case oxygen, which is most efficient, right? In the process, you essentially create syngas, right, uh, which is uh, 
uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen, which has got energy. So you convert the, the energy in the coal and biomass to carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And then using that uh, chemical energy, right, as a carrier, you can create hydrogen, you can generate power through uh, clean coal power plants, you can generate, uh, you can take carbon dioxide and capture it for the purposes of industrial production uh, of, of manufactured goods like baking soda. You can use that for, more importantly, uh, generating oil. Uh, you can create liquid fuels like uh, gasoline or uh, you know uh, other other uh, non-gas liquids. You can create fertilizers, chemical steel, and so on and so forth. Right. So there's a, there's a wide variety of of applications that can be really uh, engendered using syngas uh, that is produced through uh, coal and biomass using water and oxygen. So that's basically the gasification process. I just just uh, to give an idea of what this means. Right. And, and what does it mean in terms of economics, right? And, and why does it make sense? And that's, that's, the, that's the question to ask. Because end of the day, none of these things will work if the economics doesn't work, right? So there can be a lot of pilots and a lot of talks, but if you don't have the economics right, uh, you know, this, this thing doesn't work. And so we've, we try to model, like, what might it mean to look at the uh, to, to make it work from an economic perspective, right? So, so here are two examples of two graphs, right, which talks about on the left, um, you know, uh, ethane is one of uh, the energy uh, carriers that's used for production of plastics called ethylene. Uh, and so this ethane cost in dollar per energy units, MMBTU, and then on the, on the, on the x-axis you got ethylene cash production cost, which is one of the cash costs of production. And the gray, what you call line, talks about uh, the cost of production of uh, ethylene with respect to the price of ethane, depending upon uh, price, what price you import. And the red line talks about, you know, on, a, on, a, on, the, on the opposite scale on the right hand side, the cost of coal, right, for the same ethylene cash cost production. So the blue line out here, which intersects between, uh, you know, the cash cost of production, let's say are about $650, million, uh, $650 per ton, tells you that at about $14 per MMBTU of ethane cost, which is the cost of which, you know, got landed cost of ethane in, in India usually, your cost of coal should be at about forty dollars, right? If you go above forty dollars, you will not meet your EBITDA and the ROI numbers, right? So, so that this graph gives you an idea, you know, of how the dynamics of the prices between coal and uh, other uh, crude-based carriers like ethane, uh, you know, interact, and what are these crossover points? And so, similarly, uh, if you look at this yellow line, uh, you know, on the on the left, you're talking about if ethylene cash cost right goes down to kind of like uh, you know f four fifty dollars, and if you have uh, essentially ethane cost going to ten dollars per MMBTU, your corresponding cash cost right of coal has got to be about twenty five dollars, which is like uh, real low. Okay, uh, and we've done the same thing with crude oil with ethylene cash cost production based on naphtha, right? Because uh, the two ways of creating plastics, one is uh, chemicals uh, in, in the in the, in the space. One is, of course, using ethane, and the second is using naphtha, which is a crude derivative, and similar dynamics play. So what this results in, essentially based on our model simulations, is that for CTO or coal to olefins or coal to chemicals to be competitive uh, with crude derivatives, coal has got to be at about $40 per ton, right? And that's, that's, that's a way to do it, right? And, uh, and uh, you know, with the with the with the price of coal dropping over time, uh, with uh, with the domestic coal production uh, uh, where it is in terms of availability of high ash coals, uh, it it probably makes a lot of sense to look at coal to model the coal uh, coal supply chain in a way which allows you to get to the cost of about forty dollars per ton, right, in the long run. And of course, there's this whole thing about volatility. Right. Uh, given the fact that you're going to deal with coal, the volatility is going to be much less. So the so the drivers in terms of economic performance of these industries based on um, methanol as a carrier or chemicals as a carrier is going to be very very attractive. Right. Okay. So uh, so let's look at this. Uh, what it looks like. Right. In terms of a, of a, of a sustainable economy based on gasification and carbon capture. So what you're talking about, this is something what you call, uh, we model this based on these, these goals and those assumptions and those, uh, and those data parameters that I just talked about. And uh, this is something what you call the CGE model or a computable general equilibrium model. You know, sounds a mouthful, but it's very simple. It's basically looking at all these elements and trying to figure out what the effect is of each element on the other and hence what is the impact on the economy in terms of investments and output. So on the top you got imported coal plus uh, plus domestic coal because you can sweeten the coal a little bit because the coal quality is we're talking about is high ash coal, 
and then you feed that to what we call as uh, you know the, the the gasifiers, and there are different types of gasifiers. Uh, uh, fluidized bed gasifier, there's a fixed bed gasifier, and twin flow gasifier, there's different kinds of gasifiers. In the case of, 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 of high ash coals, uh, you probably will go with fluidized bed gasifiers, as I'll talk about later. Use this to gasify and then drive a set of industries, right? The chemicals industry is basically methanol derivative based industry. You've got steel, which is going to use uh, the gas essentially for uh, converting uh, iron ore into steel or, or iron. And you've got urea or, or ammonia which is derived basically from the, the carbon monoxide and hydrogen right, synthesized using the Heber-Bosch process. In the process, you're talking about doing a capture of about 80% of the carbon dioxide, right? And we call it a pre-combustion capture, and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in a while. Essentially, you're talking about taking the, the carbon dioxide out from a high pressure, high concentration environment and running it through a carbon capture process. Um, uh, which then is compressed and then sent out for what you call as EOR, uh, enhanced oil recovery, so as to, to generate more oil from depleting oil fields and for storage, right, in case it's, uh, you know, EOR is not possible, right, and uh, that's the combination we think that our model tells us, right. So this essentially gives you a $66 billion impact in terms of investments, right, and, and this $30 billion plus impact in terms of GDP, right. So. So that's the generic model that we think works, right? And, and we, have, we are working on a couple of what we call specific instantiations of that model, right, in specific areas. Um, so let's talk a little bit. I'll just quickly go through this, this in terms of what do we mean by carbon capture and, and, and utilization storage. For those of you who know about it, I think it'll be just a repetition. But, but essentially, what you're talking about is separation of CO2 from flue gases, um, you know, uh, from the emission sources. Uh, we are talking about transporting those gases, CO2, uh, CO2 to locations where it can be utilized or stored, either for oil or for storage. Uh, and uh, obviously, we're talking about injection in a geological structure uh, for the purposes of uh, you know, storage or for utilizing EOR, or also for the purposes of, uh, of, of uh, manufacturing beverages in the beverage industry. Uh, so here's how it looks like, uh, very simple, gasification generates CO2, uh, which generates coal to chemicals. You take the CO2 and capture this using a carbon capture system, uh, and then you put it down for enhanced oil recovery, like you talked about, like I talked about earlier, or for s geological storage, right, uh, in, uh, in deep seams, the coal bed seams, or in uh, ocean floors, there are multiple options out here, okay. Uh, now, the two types of capture, and I'll, I think it's important to talk about it a little bit, uh, one is called the post-combustion CO2 capture. This is essentially something like I want to suck CO2 out of flue gases, right, coming out of the power plant. I want to suck CO2 out of the air. A lot of projects going on in the United States, as you might know, of direct air capture. I mean, those are all post-combustion capture systems. Essentially, CO2 is emitted, and I just want to capture it after the, pro after the fact, right? But this is not exactly very uh, economically attractive, right, because uh, the flue gas concentration, the CO2 concentration in flue gas is rather low. 3 to 15 percent, and so the cost of capture becomes very high because you deal with very high volumes of, of, of the flue gas, right? And the pressures are very low, and so the capital costs are high, and, and all those not so good things happen, driving the cost structures higher on the, on the CO2, cap, uh, CO2 capture using post combustion capture systems. Uh, the other option, which is what we are considering out here essentially, is to engineer the systems in a way which allow you to capture the CO2 in the gasification process itself, right? And so essentially what we're talking about is as, uh, as the gasification process runs and produces syngas, you're, you've got high pressure CO2 coming out at a very high concentration. So it's ideal for capture using something like something called acid gas recovery or pressure swing adsorption, uh, you know, which are, which are chemical mechanical processes which allow you to capture the CO2 at a much lower cost structure. And this is what makes sense, right? And this is what we have considered in all our uh, design considerations for the economy, the industrial economy based on methanol and gasification, right? So pre-combustion capture is more suitable than post-combustion for the proposed coal to chemicals and coal to energy based industry in India, right? And that's what we'll, that's what we'll use in this case. Uh, the key consideration, right, for any of these things to work, and, 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 and I'm reminded of Professor Ed Crawley, who who's to teach me uh, way back in 97 about uh, system architecture, and he told me, Atano, one day you will face this whole thing about how to design complex systems and complex architectures, and, and, and I said, ah, that doesn't make sense, but uh, here I am, right, and, and it's exactly the same thing, right, where you're talking about architecture, uh, of complex systems, right, uh, which need to be flexible, which need to be scale, right, 
and that's that's it's it's difficult, right? And 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 so here is uh, here's an attempt, right, at how we looked at architecture from a scale, flexibility, and policy perspective, and especially and especially in the case of uh, of a countrywide and nationwide design, you got to talk about you got to look at the policy levers too in terms of how you design such an architecture, and so uh, we got to look at what are the some of the you know, you got to think about, given the goals, given what you want to do, what are the essential enablers of a clean coal-based gasification economy, right? Obviously, technology is an essential enabler, right? And so, so we, we think based on the type of coal that you have, you are talking about fluidized bed gasification technology, right? Uh, we're talking about coal science because, you know, there's a lot of coal science. Coal is everything to this thing, right? If coal is not right and it's not done right for the purposes of... Uh, making gasification work, uh, you know, gasification by itself, whatever technology you might have will not work, right? So coal science is very, very important. We need to, we need to think about scale, right? And, 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 and the idea essentially is to look at hyperscale. You know, it's, uh, a lot of people tried it, uh, the gasification-based systems uh, to generate power in the United States specifically. One of the biggest failures, as you might know, uh, might have heard, is Kemper County, right, uh, in Mississippi, where they tried to generate power using gasification of lignite. Didn't work out because the economics didn't work out, right? Uh, and the reason why it didn't work out was because you are trying to kind of like uh, generate, you're trying to create a gasification capital, uh, a ca gasification system based on its corresponding capital and operational cost amortized only to a power plant. That doesn't work because the economies of scale doesn't work, right? It'll never work, right? So you've got to have this hyperscale separated gasification system, which then is able to drive multiple industries or multiple systems. That way you are really kind of amortizing or kind of like taking advantage of the multiple cost structure advantages that you can take off, right? Based on scale and the characteristics of these different industries, right? So uh, a way to think about it is like, you know, I want to, let's say, want to, want to, buy uh, and run a toaster, right? And you say, oh, for toaster, like or electricity, right? And you say, oh, oh, you know what? I want to put up a power plant for that, right? Clearly, that toaster is not going to work, right, from an economic perspective. So it's something like that, right? You want to have this architected in a way with the separation between scale and the downstream components in a way which is synergistic from an economic and operational perspective, right? Uh, and then uh, technology, methanol to olefins technology is very important for this, right, where you're essentially using methanol as an energy carrier to be able to drive uh, generation of olefins, right. Like I said, a very large scale gasification operations. This is not going to work on small scale. This is not going to work when I say I'm going to have gasification drive a power plant or gasification drive a chemical plant. No. It's got to be a, a large scale gasification utility just like large scale power utility, right. Uh, you got to have this whole architecture separation with the right kind of interfaces, right? Uh, and, and, you, and, 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 and SDM folks, those of you folks who are gone through SDM, you'll know that separation requires interface definitions. And defining interfaces at this scale is complex, right? And requires a lot of thought on how interfaces can be defined across gasifier and downstream uh, utilities and downstream industries, right? Uh, and obviously, this has got a lot of implications in terms of what it means in terms of capital costs, what it means in terms of operations cost advantage, what it means in terms of entry attractiveness, right? Because what you want to make sure is that different industries are attractive uh, enough from a perspective of entry using gasification as a, as, as a fuel, or gasification as a process and thin gas as a fuel, right? So that the investment uh, for the downstream eco ecosystem is rather low and it drives a virtuous cycle of investment of multiple industries with high ROI. Uh, one of the very important things to consider in this case is the supply chain, right? And the supply chain has got to do with the, basically the feedstock supply chain. And you've got to move very large volumes of uh, coal, right, across different areas, right? And so logistics becomes very important, right? Uh, logistics both from an internal perspe perspective as well as from import perspective, right? And so the whole idea was to develop the, around the coast using coastal clusters. You know, uh, you might know that clusters have the, one of the highest productivity and, and logistically are the, probably the most efficient, right, in terms of designing such large-scale systems, right? And so using multimodal logistics, right, using coastal clusters, right, with the right kind of blends of coal is important for making this thing happen in terms of uh, the supply chain, the feedstock supply chain. 
And finally, I think a very important consideration is policy. Without policy uh, mechanisms uh, in the right areas, it is not possible for this, for this to work, right? So one of the policy mechanisms is the whole thing around coal blocks, right? I don't know whether you know or not, but India had this whole problem about coal blocks, right? Allocation scams, and you know, and so they decided to what they call auction coal blocks at the highest price. But that doesn't really work in the situation where the social outcome is much higher than the outcome of the coal block auction, right? So what makes more sense out here is to allocate kind of like this high uh, ash coals, which are lying around anyway, at near zero marginal cost, right? And so that way what happens is the social outcome of the entire process is much, much higher and it makes a lot of sense, right, in terms of allocating the coal blocks in a way. And we have a couple of mechanisms that we designed around how to allocate coal blocks in the best way. And then um, obviously, uh, you know, this, given the scale characteristics that you're talking about, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, opportunity and possibility, right, for uh, monopolistic behavior of certain firms, right? So to have the right policies for uh, participation and avoid monopoly and, uh, and hence its, uh, its effects is important from a policy perspective to make sure that this thing runs. And obviously demand creation for the new kind of what you call chemicals and new kind of processes for substitution is important. And we suggested a 45Q, which is a U.S. what you call program for uh, carbon credits, uh, you know, investment carbon credits and operational credits, uh, which uh, we think is deficit neutral and can, can be really what you call made to work, right? So, so those are the essential enablers from an architectural perspective, which I think is important, right, at the economy level to make this industry happen, right? And so essentially drive coastal clusters, right, uh, using technology scale, supply chains, and policy. Uh, here's what it looks like. Don't want to complicate this stuff, but how would it look like a syngas grid-based clean coal coastal cluster, right? And so on the left, you've got this hyperscale syngas utility. Each cluster is like a large cluster of industries along with, uh, you know, a, a separated hyperscale syngas utility, right, which creates the syngas just like power and gives it a syngas grid at a cost structure which is pretty affordable and, and uh, attractive at $5.5 MBTU. And that goes into these consumers of this, this gas, which is uh, you know, called to all the uh, through methanol, uh, DME, which is uh, for LPG blending and diesel blending, and methanol itself for petrol blending and different chemicals, right? And so the numbers talk about the investments, and the numbers talk about you know, the, uh, the, the outputs, and, 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 and then you've got, of course, the CO2 processing hub, uh, which processes the whole thing in terms of CO2 that is captured, and this is, again, a separate utility at scale which gives you that cost structure, which is attractive in terms of storage at $10 per ton and EOR at $10 per ton, uh, which can be utilized either for export or for the purposes of CO2 EOR. And then you've got a corresponding a power utility, uh, which is run by the gasification system, which supplies power to this cluster. So this is what a cluster looks like, right? And these clusters are multiple clusters across the coastlines, right? So each of them, seven MTPA, uh, are seven million tons per annum of methanol production and its derivative production across uh, you know, six such regions around the coast, which we think uh, gives you a lot of advantage in terms of the savings of uh, logistics, in terms of feedstock, uh, cost of olefins, in terms of transportation, uh, in terms of CO2 transport and export for EOR through ships, for example. And of course, in terms of storage, CO2 storage uh, at the coastlines, which we're working with UT Austin around that area, right, in terms of how to store CO2 with the right kind of mapping. And uh, obviously, future desalination plant for use of water because gasification consumes a lot of water. So desalination is probably the right way to go. And if you're, if you're a coastal cluster, that's easy for you to desalinate the water to be able to utilize that for gasification. Uh, and finally, I think, uh, you know, from an architecture perspective, the policy is very important, right? And market design and investment policy is critical, right, for making this happen, right? So market design, what do you mean by that, right? Uh, one of the things you're talking about is substitution, right? So there's a market design element out here where you say, okay, 15% of, of, of the gasoline will be substituted with methanol, right? That's a government policy, right? So that automatically creates demand. Uh, investment policy is encouraging, uh, you know, in terms of investments in the area, right? And so the tax breaks policies that we have defined, which make a lot of sense. Uh, I think on the supply side, we're talking about a lot of policy in terms of coal supply, coal logistics. We're talking about policies in terms of how do you really scale this and avoid monopolies, right, and price gouging. And so uh, the ability to provide the right kind of regulated monopoly structures for these gasification utilities, 
uh, while uh, making the other downstream industries, uh, you know, driven by market mechanisms is probably the way to go. And similarly, technology transfer policies that you work with DOE uh, in terms of technology transfers and also environment and carbon emissions policies in the 45Q and others I talked about, right? So, amalgamation of all this thing essentially drives your high ash coal to syngas to methanol ammonia steel to petrol, DME, diesel, LPG, olefins with the bottom lines that talks about the capture mechanism, pre-combustion capture, storage, and UR, right? So, so that's like kind of like the arc, the framework for, for a policy that we're working on uh, uh, on the gasification economy, right? Uh, Quickly go through this 140, I'll quickly go through the, the sustainability architecture of carbon capture, and this is important, uh, we think, because uh, how you design the sustainability architecture is very important in terms of how it works, right? And so essentially, again, a lot of numbers out here, don't want to go into the details. What it talks about is on the left hand side, you've got these different industries methanol, steel, urea, which generates different kinds of carbon dioxide, right? When it's, one is pre combustion, the second is post combustion. And you're saying that we take the pre combustion carbon dioxide to start with, go ahead, take it through a carbon capture facility. Uh, we're talking those numbers of 85 MTPA at 75 percent capture goes through EOR or storage, right? And which can, which has got effect in terms of substitution in terms of oil recovery and, uh, you know, uh, and reduction of parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, right? And some numbers on the cost are out here. Happy to talk about it later if you want, but these are details which we can talk about, right? And the other thing that you, that I just want to touch upon is that to do this uh, in, in a way, we've got to step ahead of the 45Q mechanism of the U.S., right? We think that a cluster finance corporation, right, which is like a, is a way to finance all these carbon dioxide emissions, right, with carbon credits, right? Because otherwise, if you don't give carbon credits, there's no incentive, right, to implement a carbon capture system in industry, right? And so the way to do that, we think, is two things, right? One is this blue dots you see on the top, right, are, are essentially uh, credits we give to carbon capture uh, for at a certain rate. And credits we give for power offtake and gasifier offtake, and uh, and this is something that's required for the purposes of avoiding market failure, right? Um, and I can talk about it later. But essentially, what we're saying is that we have credit, de credit default swaps on gasifier offtakes and power offtakes, so that you know there's an incentive to build them, right, uh, by different investors. Uh, and then this whole thing is financed using something called a you know cluster finance corporation. Which is a combination, which is sovereign, sovereign guaranteed, and that in, that that invites a lot of uh, uh, debt from the bond markets, about 1.5 billion dollars, put in about 5 million dollars of equity, and you invest that into these clusters, right? Which gives you a good return, 18, 20 percent in the long run. Uh, from the taxes, you know, which is in the green lines, you basically fund the CFC further, and you pay back what you call the 90 million dollars in the bond markets, and so this whole thing becomes sustainable, right? Self-financing in a way. Uh, because the fundamental assumption is that based on the investments you make in this economy, they generate sufficient taxes and returns to be able to fund all these what you call mechanisms. Uh, what does it mean in terms of socioeconomics of a clean coal based economy? And again, this is again one of the aspects that you could talk about, think about, right, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, architecture, nationwide architecture of uh, such a system, right? And so uh, impacts are quite significant, right? And so if you look at it, right, uh, the three or four lines, one is the, what's the incremental direct GDP, right, from a consumption perspective that is affected, and you have $30 billion, which is not insignificant. More importantly, the employment generation, right, direct and indirect, is significant, right, about a million, a million heads of employment generated, right, direct and indirect, uh, is not insignificant. It draws in a lot of investment, like I talked about earlier, $66 billion over 10, 15 year time period, time horizon. And it's got high spillover index in certain areas like methanol and chemicals and steel and, and ammonia because they tend to uh, uh, extend the technological capacity of a nation, right? And so that's the spillover index, right? So, so from all those perspectives, it looks kind of like interesting and nice. And finally, uh, you know, how, what does it mean in terms of trade and dynamics, right? Because that's an important consideration, right? So if you look at it, like I mentioned earlier, uh, this changes the trade balance, right, of the, of the nation, right? And I've taken India out here. This can be very well applicable to some other na nations too, right? And so on the left-hand side, it talks about increase in import, right? And the right-hand side, it talks about substitution of import, right? So if you look at all these numbers, what you're talking about is uh, some imports increase, like some coal imports of high-quality coal to be blended and needs to increase. Technology imports from the United States, for example, increase, right? Uh, but on the, on, the, on the overall scheme of things, you're talking about a $20 billion, right, uh, substitution of import, right, which is kind of interesting for a country uh, developing nation, right? Uh, so 
from all these aspects, uh, gasification based economy with carbon capture looks to be a very interesting way of going about, uh, embarking about uh, a national transformation, which we are kind of like starting, started on the past two years. And hopefully over the next uh, decade or so, uh, this will kind of like uh, uh, go into implementation in different forms and, and uh, reap the benefits for the country and, uh, and other partners. And finally, uh, this also drives the other thing in terms of how it generates what you call a spillover, right? And so this is a, an example of uh, uh, on the left-hand side is how technology transfer takes place, right? And China has done this very well, right? And one of the things you want to do for a nation is you really want to drive the, the, the spillover index and, and, the, and the adoption of technology for a nation, driving the productivity higher. So from one to five are the different stages. And if you look at, you know, what we estimate is that different areas, gasifier technology, carbon capture technology, coal blending, sequestration, these things will have different forms. Two and five are basically first of a kind technology transfer and five is, you know, full scale transfer and production, right? And it's got a significant impact in terms of these technologies, right? And so that's it, gentlemen uh, and, and ladies. I think, I think hopefully that is useful and interesting. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them at this point of time. Thank you, Atanu, for that fascinating lecture. Um, again, if people have questions, they can feel free to enter them in the chat window at the side of the video. Uh, I just want to say it was really interesting as a talk. Um, one part that this is a very minor detail, but I hadn't thought about the fact that you could capture the CO2 from this kind of process and then transfer it to the beverage industry. Uh, it's something that I don't think a lot of us think about as far as where the bubbles in our seltzer come from, but it's a nice side effect, I guess. Yes, absolutely, yes, that's right. Huh? Um, and one thing that I also found really interesting towards the start of the talk, um, just talking about the various sectors that are contributing to emissions, um, I feel that much of the discussion kind of in current culture, at least in the U.S., is about individual effects. You know, stop driving your car, take public transit instead, stop using so many plastics in your personal life. But as you showed in your chart, a lot of the emissions are coming from industry. And that's something that is much harder to tackle on an individual basis. But if it's considered through public policy, like you discuss in creating this kind of new take on an industrial economy, it could have significant effects. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if there's anything further you'd like to say about kind of the various industry breakdowns that that comes from, if you can be more granular yeah, about that. So if, yeah, so, so certainly if you, if, you look at, if you look at the industry, right, and again, this is worldwide, right, mm -hmm. uh, there are certain materials, right, which uh, humankind cannot live without, right, steel, uh, you know, cement, uh, mm -hmm. you know, chemicals and, and plastics, right. And uh, they are a significant contributor, right? Steel contributes about 8%, right, of the total CO2 emissions in, uh, of 35 gigatons, right? Uh, chemicals, 3 to 4%, right? Cement, another 10%. So these are significant contributors of CO2, right? And, uh, you know, people really don't look at it, have not looked at it, because it's, uh, it's not easy to, what you call, abate those emissions, right? And so if you are able to transform some of the feedstocks or the mechanisms which drive the industrial process, you can bring that down significantly. And that's what we talked about you know, mm -hmm. here, right, and how you can go about bringing that. And I think the most opportune countries for, the, for them are the developing nations like India because they're embarking on developing their manufacturing economy, like a steel, like a cement, like a, you know, uh, plastics and, and others, not the United States. The United States is more mature in terms of those kind of manufacturing, right? So the opportunity really lies out there to contain those emissions by using industrial processes, right, around this, which really allow you to enable you to do that. Right. right. So the hope would be that before they get too entrenched in more typical fossil fuel use, fuel usage, you could get them onto the system that comes out of the gasification. That's correct. Yes, absolutely. All right, so it looks like we do have a question from Anand Marathe, uh, who says, an excellent presentation, which I agree with. Are any of these carbon capture technologies currently implement, uh, initiated for implementation? Yeah, so, uh, so the carbon capture technologies, like I said, right, uh, uh, have been in implementation in the United States and Europe for a long time, for quite some time, right? So if you look at some of the projects, uh, like the Boundary Dam project in Canada, right, utilizes post-combustion capture to capture about 2 million tons of CO2 per year, right? 
If you look at the Petronova project in the United States, which is again a power plant post combustion capture systems about 2 million tons per year. If you look at, uh, you know, there's a, there's a capture system in uh, Sleipner in Norway, which captures about a million ton per year, right? And there are multiple others, right, of smaller scale that are being implemented, right? Now, most of these systems that are being implemented are post combustion capture systems, which has got to do with capturing uh, CO2 from the flue gases, which is not exactly very economically uh, attractive, right? There are some pre-combustion capture systems that, like in the United States, uh, you know, where they use for EOR, like Archer Daniels Midland, Com Midland Company in, in Decatur, Illinois, uses that, right? And so those are very, very, very attractive from an economic perspective, right? So yes, there have been implementations, right, at commercial scale. And uh, as we move further, right, and as we implement more pre-combustion carbon capture systems, right, at the right kind of cost structures, uh, we think that the opportunity for utilizing these is significant right over time. Yeah, I think that's a really good rundown. Um, a similar and related question from S. Tuete Gupta, who asks, what elements of the architecture are near ready and which are kind of further out? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, the, the architecture for gasification system is, uh, is near ready, right? Uh, we are talking about uh, one cluster right now uh, in the in the eastern part of India, right, uh, which is going to happen sometime shortly, right. Uh, the carbon capture systems are a little farther out uh, in terms of the implementation. We are doing the mapping, right, of the carbon capture systems uh, in terms of storage mapping in the in the in the in the eastern part of India, in the ocean floors of uh, of, of the east, right. And that's going to take a little while, right. On the other hand, uh, the EOR mechanisms are kind of like ready, right. So the two uh, specific UOR sites that we're talking about, right? Uh, one is called Bombay High, which is one of their oil production units uh, in, in India. And the second is with, a, with another oil company out in the northern part of India, right, for UOR, right? So this is the starting points, right, in terms of the carbon mm -hmm. capture, but they're farther out. The gasification systems are kind of like there. It's not it's the rocket science. I think the other piece, which is a challenge, which we think needs, to, needs a lot more work, right? is the whole thing what I talked about is coal science, being able to have the right kind of feedstock, the right blend, right, to be able to feed the gasifier, right? Because these gasification and chemical energy systems are very sensitive to feedstock. Being able to feed the right kind of blend on a consistent basis is the key to the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's some work that's being done out there which needs some more work, right, in terms of actual, actual happening. Okay, we had another question from Anand Marathe uh, on the capturing of CO2 pre-combustion does this technology require more inve investment than post-combustion? Uh, well, no. So here's the, here's the beauty of the pre-combustion systems, right? Uh, so what you typically do in a, in a gasification system is that, uh, you know, if you are doing gasification and creating chemicals or steel or, or, or whatever, right, you would need to clean that gas out, right, uh, for sulfur or there are different impurities, right? And in the process, you will also need to remove the CO2 irrespective. Whether you want to remove CO2 or not, doesn't matter, you have to. So the cost of CO2 removal, the capital cost and the operating cost is a part of the entire system that you, the industrial system, right, or the plant. So there's no separate investment for pre-combustion okay. capture, right? The only separate investment for pre-combustion capture is, has got to do with taking that CO2 and compressing that and transporting that over a pipeline to a place for storage or for oil recovery, right? So that's, that's why it's much cheaper, right? Much, much cheaper from a capital cost and operational cost perspective compared to post-combustion. But to retrofit something on top of the flue gas stack of a power plant, for example, which has got significant capital costs, right, and adds mm -hmm. to the cost of operations and the ROI. Right? That makes a great deal of sense. Um, so I had one more kind of more philosophical question, I guess. Uh, the talk is, was entitled uh, Enabling a Gasification-Based Sustainable Industrial Economy for India, and it does feel that the sustainability is more about the economics of it, which is absolutely very important, especially for India as a country. Um, but sustainability on more of the environmental side is also a, an ongoing question. And since this is still based on a fossil fuel on coal, would it be something that would be hopefully to fill the gap while more research is being done on renewables? 
Yeah. So here's the question I get asked all the time: What about renewables, right? And 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 and, and the two two answers to this question, right? Or two dimensions to this question, right? One is renewables, right? And again, this is across the world, right? Renewables are intermittent sources of energy, right? And people say, oh, cost of renewable power, for example, solar cells are dropped right to a dollar less, less than a dollar a watt. Mm -hmm. That doesn't tell the story, right? What I want as a consumer today is 24 by 7 power, right, available to me at that quality, right? If I don't get that, if, I, if you tell me that, hey, you know what, Haru, you're going to get four hours of power, and then after that one hour, there's going to be no power, and again, that will just make the economy collapse, right? So if you design a renewable system which is sustainable uh, or which is, which is available and reliable on a 24 by 7 basis, you have to back it up with gas-based power systems or coal-based power systems or battery storage, right? That will increase the cost of the renewable system exponentially. And if you do the workings, you will see that it exponentially increases. The battery storage costs, right, it's just exponential, right? It's very, very high. Similarly, if you look at Germany, for example, which tried this, right, which is farthest ahead in the renewables, right? They could not take the coal-based power plant out because they have to back the renewable powers out. When the wind doesn't blow, sun doesn't shine, you can't say I'm going to have power, right? Mm -hmm. So in the process, the, 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 the amount of CO2 emissions have not come down, but have remained the same or gone up. And the cost of power has gone up by more than 70%. So one has got to be careful in terms of characterizing renewables, right? As, so this is not a, we got to figure out a way, we got to figure out a way to take CO2 out of the system. You know, so power is one part of the story which renewables will only fill to some degree. Renewables as best is a complement. We've got to find out, figure out a way of how to have the other power systems like a gas-based power system or coal for that matter or nuclear, right? To be able to complement this, right? Take the CO2 out and really create a sustainable economy, right? Because the other thing, renewables in terms of, oh, this is, a, you know, this is the panacea to everything, is wrong, plain wrong, okay? The other part has got to do with what I talked about, right? How much renewables you have. You can never, at least in the foreseeable future, you cannot change a steel making process. You cannot change a cement making process. You cannot change a plastic making process which has been evolved over the past, you know, 70, 80 years. There's nothing on the horizon, right, at least that we see, right, which does not emit carbon dioxide, right? So you've got to have mechanism by which if there's a way to change the feedstock and be able to capture the carbon. So renewables is a complement. I think much as people might like to believe that this is a panacea, it is not. We do not believe that it's going to be a solution for the next 30, 40, 50 years, unless, of course, something miraculous happens like in MIT. Who knows? <laughs> that's, that's where it comes out from, right? It's quite possible. If that happens, all bets are off, right? So research should continue, but we should plan, right, from a sustainability perspective, how do I contain the CO2 and capture the CO2 from systems that I've got, which in all likelihood is not going to change over the next 15, 20, 30 years. That's a really detailed answer and I do appreciate it. Uh, it looks like we had one more question come through uh, asking, are power plants in India playing a major role in gasification and carbon capture or will they, I guess? Uh, will other industries go for it and what's their benefit? Right, so I think uh, if you looked at this whole presentation, we focused on the, the chemicals and the and the, and the industry side, right? We did not really focus on the power side, right? And the reason why we did not do that, because power system in India is really broken, right? And so, uh, you know, the, uh, it is impossible right now today, given the, the structure of the power system, right? It has a distribution problems and the problems in terms of the generation, to be able to really put a carbon capture system on them. It'll just break the entire model. And the economic model, economic model breaks, then nothing works. There's a saying that, you know, in a competition between technology and economics, economics always wins, always. The history of what we call science has shown that, right? So if you focus on power, we could have focused on power on the carbon capture side, but that would just not be viable because the power systems out there are very, very inefficient, right? Distribution systems are non-functional, right? So if you impose a CO2 capture system on that, the cost of power is just going to bloat and some of the power system will not work, right? So that is why we said we'll engineer something which is right from ground up, which is much more relevant and, and, and viable, right? And set the stage out there, and as the power systems evolve, then you move them to gas-based power systems over time, right, for the experience learned from out here. All right, I think we're coming up on the end of our time together. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so thank you again, Atanu, for sharing your lunch hour with us and for sharing your expertise. And thank you to our attendees for joining us today. Again, the presentation recording will be available online after this session. We will be taking a break for the winter holidays, but the webinar series will resume in February of 2020 with Nicholas Ashford, professor in MIT School of Engineering. On behalf of the System Design and Management Program, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Naomi.